it happened my junior year. I was really depressed. I just felt out of control with life and I just decided I was gonna control my life with food. I started purging and then eventually just let it complete starvation. Like I didn't eat anything, just drink water. And I went to purge and I could taste blood in my mouth and then I realized I have a problem. In June, I was hospitalized for suicidal thoughts. My insurance ran out, so I was only there for three days. I can't do this anymore. I feel like they told me I was unfixable. And the insurance company's denial said, you are purging 45 times a day. This is normal. You no longer need treatment. And I thought, oh my gosh, this must be a typo. He meant like four to five times a day. And it wasn't. Her average baseline for purging was 45 times a day. And he said, you're fine. You don't need treatment. It's, it's challenging on Capitol Hill these days to, um, to get support uh, to pass anything, uh, particularly if it costs money. And in this case, uh, the, we want insurance companies to ensure the treatment that's necessary for someone who's battling an eating disorder to be able to, uh, to overcome it. It's hard to, um, to find support for spending more money, even if that money is going to wind up uh, helping to save lives. You're emotionally numb, like because of the depression, and then you're just everything to you. Like you put it in your body, it's gonna make you fat. Like even water to you at some points is like it's gonna make me fat. You just turn into something completely different, somebody you don't even recognize. and I even told them I wasn't ready. The insurance shouldn't be the dictator of the medical aspect of it and deciding when somebody is truly ready to be sent home and ready to be healed. Hi, buddy. <laughs> right, we have to be very serious. We're telling a story that could help people. I suffered with an eating disorder for about 18 years of my life. It, it destroys like everything like that should be normal in your life and you're doing it because you think that being thin or having the perfect body is going to make you happy um, and it never did. It made me completely miserable like every single moment that I was in the disorder. The odd thing was that I started the eating disorder so that everybody would like me and it turned out that everybody really didn't like me because of the eating disorder. They just really hated the eating disorder and they hated like always talking about like do I look fat and you know do you think I need to lose weight and that kind of thing. It really annoys people. <laughs> I was really alone. I used to call my own answering machine just to like leave a message you know so I'd have something to come home to. I found this place online and it was a treatment center. They really knew how I was feeling and that they could help me. And um, they said, yeah, you know what, we have an open bed. And, um, and so then they told me I needed a check for $45,000 for 30 days. And I was like, there's no way. I, do, I, I said, I don't have that. My insurance doesn't cover this. And so I started thinking about, um, you know, just how much better off the world would be without me. And um, I was absolutely convinced that that was, that was what needed to happen. So I started planning for that. I started planning my suicide. It 
So many people I know who suffer eating disorders don't think that they're gonna be the one who dies even when they're the one thinking about taking their own life. Like I just really never really conceptualized like death is final and it leaves behind a whole heck of a lot of pain that doesn't heal. And I uh, got an email one day from the policy director of the Eating Disorders Coalition. She wanted me to come tell my story in Washington, D.C. And I read my speech as if there was, you know, I was totally fine. And um, I tried to like portray to the audience that I used to have an eating disorder, you know. But meanwhile, I had left a note, a suicide note behind um, because my plan was to give my speech and then go commit suicide. And then there's all these people like coming up to hug me and they're crying and I'm like, what's the big deal? There's no big deal, I'm not that skinny. But these two people like kept moving towards the back and just to kind of, I guess, be the last ones in the room with me. And um, but it was Mr. and Mrs. George. And he said, we lost our daughter a few months ago and you need help or you're going to die. I mean, his, you know, part of it I think was that his face was just like sobbing and wet with tears and, uh, and I knew that I had purged that morning. And when he said that his daughter had died of bulimia, I think I felt like the worst person in the entire world because clearly he was very sad um, and no longer having his daughter. And I had just done the very thing that took her own life. And, uh, I made a promise that day that I would do everything in my power to fully recover, um, and I was going to do it for him and then also for myself. So instead of June 13th, uh, 2002 being the day that I died, it was the day that I started my final recovery process. through the memories. After Leslie passed away, I was going through her personal items, and I came upon this drawing, and I knew it was a message from her to me that she was in a better place. And it's her map to heaven, and it shows her house, going to the hospital, apartment, which she was living in in James Madison, and then the staircase to heaven. And to finalize it, uh, she became the person in heaven who distributes the wings to the angels. Now, if that wasn't a message to me that she was in a better place, I don't know who could have been. I just wish it <clears throat> I wish more people had gotten to know, know Leslie. I do. Yes. So do I. She did not have a mean bone in her body, and I know that expression is thrown around, but I can tell you she didn't. She made friends, she kept friends, and she never made enemies. And I'll tell you the other thing about Leslie, I remember when she was very young, there was not a lost dog or cat or a lost kid or an outcast that she didn't make friends with. And that was Leslie. She gave that to me uh, the first Christmas, she freshman year JMU. And her last Christmas, I gave her this. Her. It's uh, the uh, you know, bringing in of the new year, and mm -hmm. I thought, you know, 2000, she's going to have many more years to go. Isn't that why? Leslie had a group of uh, seven friends from high school. And since Leslie has passed away, every one of them has gotten married now.
and they're starting to have children. And Ron and I have been invited to every wedding. <laughs> and in every case, the bride has given me her bouquet at the end of the wedding to take to Leslie's grave site. And it has meant so much to us to, um, that they remember her in that way and they say they always will. She was a friend of a friend. <laughs> These were her, her favorite people. We have to just keep pushing and pushing and pushing, and uh, every, every year, every time we start again, we get more people involved, and that's what we're gonna do. This is about people. This is about daughters and sons and sisters and brothers and dads and moms that should not have died. Um, you know, had they had access to reputable treatment and a adequate treatment through their insurance coverage. I'd like to dream about some of the things she would have done, but uh, we don't get the chance. They are they are dreams, and they're unfortunately only dreams right now, and that's the way it'll always be. Do you think that this is something you're gonna have to deal with forever? Like, you think this is something that's gonna be an ongoing problem? I hope not. Um, I think. It's gonna get easier as the years go by. I really do feel like, I just feel like the time is now. Yeah.